left. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, which is in the framework of the working group three. Uh, today, the topic is going to be illicit trafficking of cultural properties, which you may know is a kind of very uh, important treat uh, worldwide, not only because it uh, is a treat to uh, our shared heritage, but also because it's becoming a source of uh, money laundering for organized crime and also has been recognized as a, a source of uh, revenge for a terrorist organization. Uh, our uh, speaker today is Dr. Christor Tsiroyannis. Uh, Chris is a forensic archaeologist based in Cambridge, where he obtained his PhD on the International Traffic Networks on Antiquities. He held a postdoc position at the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research of the University of Glasgow between 2014 and 16. And he was a research fellow at the Arhaus Institute of Advanced Studies between 2019 and 2022. He is now the head of a working group illicit antiquities trafficking of the UNESCO chair on treats to cultural heritage and uh, cultural heritage related activities of the Union uh, Universities. So, Christos, uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours, and at the end of the session, we will have a QA uh, time. Thank you very much, Dante. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you all the people in uh, Glitz, uh, Stefano, Francisco, uh, for, uh, for organizing this, and I'm very happy to, to give this uh, webinar a very brief, uh, wide, general uh, presentation of the field in the last uh, 30 years approximately um, in the hope that uh, we can find common threads and uh, paths uh, with uh, other kind of trafficking crimes uh, from uh, colleagues connected to glitz and participated in glitz um, in order to to boost cooperation among us in many other respects uh, through this glitz platform um so uh starting i would uh, say first of all that um, the idea that we had uh, until 1995 uh, of the way that antiquities were uh, trafficked uh, was quite simple and linear um uh, starting from a looter sometimes through a smuggle a smuggler or directly to a middleman and then the antiquities from the ground usually or uh, stolen from archaeological sites being previously recorded while from the ground usually completely unrecorded unknown to the countries that they were the victims of this theft um, through a middleman were reaching a dealer and then um, uh, by dealer meaning the wider market it could be auction house as well uh, and um, reaching finally a final at the time at least destination either a museum or a private collector or a financier even which is a kind of distinguishing with a private collector in the sense that a financier uh, sometimes does not share necessarily the passion of a collector to complete a collection uh, to spend time because of the aesthetic pleasure or other issues but uh, connected to the objects themselves but the financier usually it just invests uh, in, on the objects. It doesn't really make any difference uh, to him or her whether uh, this is of cultural, aesthetic, or other historical value uh, or collecting value for uh, the financier. Is, uh, it only matters whether they can make a profit um, to, to in the future. Um, so by liquidating uh, the collection. Um, this is the idea that we had in 1995, and that was because in 1994, uh, it was discovered the so-called organigram, a handwritten note, uh, discovered in, a, in an apartment in the center of Rome uh, by the Italian authorities, and uh, where it was depicted, you see the original on the left, and at the right, a transcription of it, a clearer one, uh, of most of it, by Dr. Neil Brody. And uh, what we can see is uh, that in reality it depicts the Italian branch of the international um, uh, illicit antiquities uh, trafficking network. And we have at the head, at the top, um, Robert Hecht, the American uh, uh, dealer here, uh, who was uh, operating both in Paris and U USA. 
um, and um, supplying both museums and private collectors, uh, but also two different groups, um, uh, one headed by Gianfranco Becchina, the Italian uh, uh, dealer uh, having a, a gallery in Basel, and the other, Giacomo Medici, the other Italian dealer having a, a gallery, his own gallery of antiquities in Geneva. And in between other dealers like Liborowski, uh, the Greek Nicolas Kutulakis, George Orti, who was a collector, but also a dealer cooperating with Bekina, Frida Chakos, a Greek origin dealer, but from Alexandria, Egypt, and so on. And all these are being recorded in this uh, handwritten note. Uh, further on, we can see, especially uh, connected to Gefranco Bekina, uh, other uh, smaller middlemen um, or, uh, or traffickers, and also groups of uh, people, looters, and also the names of the places where each one was uh, operating, looting, actually. Something that we can see also in the uh, group connected to Giacomo Medici. Armed with this kind of information, the Italian authorities formed a team, um, a team uh, of, uh, consisted of many uh, kind of, uh, let's say, expertises, because, for example, we had politicians like uh, Rutelli here, former uh, uh, mayor of Rome, but also later uh, minister of culture, the public prosecutor Paolo Giorgio Ferri, the late, now unfortunately Paolo Giorgio Ferri, the late uh, Roberto Conforti, the head of the uh, Italian police art squad of Carabinieri, the archaeologist Mauricio Pellegrini and Daniela Riccio um, of the Villa Villa Giulia Museum, but also um, uh, working uh, for the prosecution with uh, Paolo Giorgio Ferri, uh, the uh, 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 avocatore uh, Fiorilli, uh, who was representing the Italian state in negotiations with museums and private collections on identified pieces to be plain and successfully repatriated to Italy. And also members of the press here, for example, is Fabio Isman of Il Messaggero, uh, who often were publishing cases of antiquities uh, uh, claimed by the Italian authorities. This, uh, this thing was necessary to put together different kinds of expertise in order to work on the uh, material and to, to also fight the problem of uh, trafficking of antiquities from the Italian soil, of course, initially. And this kind of uh, operations uh, of raids that I will refer to you uh, just uh, later uh, were planned uh, effectively by uh, Paolo Giorgio Ferri and uh, in cooperation with uh, Roberto Conforti and the Carabinieri were executed uh, with judicial assistant, uh, assistance um, in the rest of Europe and uh, beyond that. Starting with Switzerland and in 1995, uh, the raid against Giacomo Medici um, and the, in Geneva and in Rome in uh, the premises of Medici. Um, in uh, here you see some uh, of the areas in the Freeport of Geneva. Uh, so we have uh, objects that they have been uh, really fragmented and covered with soil, just uh, smuggled out of Italy, ready to be restored. But at the same time, here in the in the um, cardboard boxes and uh, uh, wooden other boxes, but also at the same time in the same rooms. We have restore objects of all kinds of vases, red figure, black figure, South Italian, etc., but also marble statues, bronze statues, and other ready to be sold in the open market as legal. But the main discovery, apart from thousands of antiquities in the premises of Giacomo Medici, and especially in the Port Frank report of Geneva, uh, was the, the discovery of his archive, the well known now. Medici archives, so consisting of more than 4,000 Polaroid images and about 35,000 documents. Uh, this is a, an image from the um, uh, prosecution in Rome, uh, where um, I was given access uh, to officially to, to the Medici archive. Um, and uh, you see the files uh, uh, being collected, uh, all of them there. And this uh, was used uh, in order to use these images, Polaroid professional and regular print, to identify uh, antiquities all over the world in museums, private collect 
actors and in the market, auction houses, dealers, galleries, and claim the stolen heritage of Italian origin. Equally, later in between 2000 and 2002, three different raids were executed in Basel and in Sicily against uh, uh, Gianfranco Becchina. So you see uh, the Italian authorities are following the, uh, the plan uh, in the handwritten note uh, in the confiscated organigram. And uh, equally with the um, Medici case, um, uh, more than 5,000 antiquities were discovered in the premises in the free port of Basel this time, the premises of Gianfranco Becchina. But again, uh, the most valuable discovery was his archive, which was uh, bigger um, in terms of uh, images at least, and um, uh, it's quite extensive in documents as well with uh, more than uh, 11,000 uh, documents uh, in total. Later, uh, with the, this time judicial authorities uh, cooperation of France, uh, they raided the uh, uh, flat of Robert Heck, who have seen, uh, I remind, as a, uh, at the top of the East Antiquities Network from Italy, receiving objects from all kinds of groups, and um, uh, while some antiquities were also discovered in the flat, uh, in uh, covered with soil and in plastic uh, uh, bags, but uh, also uh, some Polaroid images, uh, the hundreds actually of Polaroid images, the, the actual discovery that uh, made the change was the handwritten memoir over 88 pages of Robert Heck that was uh, just on the top uh, of his uh, desk waiting there to be found. And uh, here is just uh, uh, one image that had been published from that, uh, showing uh, the true uh, story of how the fragments of uh, the famous Ephronius crater of Sarpedon crater, uh, still fragmented after the discovery by the Italian looters, uh, were passed to Giacomo Medici, and Medici showed up in, in the flat of uh, the Hecht couple. Um, offering and show, by showing Polaroid images of this fragmented steel uh, vase. Um, and how they negotiated together, being uh, uh, taking the train to Switzerland, seeing the, the fragments in the bank vault and paying partly at the time, immediately on the spot for these fragments. Uh, we all know the end of this uh, case, more than 30 years later, after the, the sale of the object for a record price uh, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it eventually returned to uh, Italy uh, in late 2007 and uh, was exhibited ever since and traveling around the world as an illicit antiquity. Further on in 2006, the Greek authorities this time raided um, the uh, a part of peninsula in the small part uh, in the small island of Skinusa in Greece in the Cyclades um, in an operation in a raid that um, I was honored to take place as well as a forensic archaeologist and for several days we were searching the private owned peninsula uh, where the uh, the the couple um, in all senses that substituted uh, uh, Robert Hecht uh, at the top of the list antiquities trade, at least uh, of the Italian branch, but beyond as well. Uh, depicted in the middle here, Robin Symes, the British uh, merchant, and uh, Eustos Michaelidis, his Greek partner, um, were spending their uh, summer vacation. And uh, you see some of the objects that we discovered during the raid. This is one of the images that I took. But also, again, like in the previous cases, the most in invaluable discovery was the archive, the photographic archive of Robin Symes and Christos Michaelidis, which was the only archive, photographic archive that was missing from the Italian raids to be discovered and was completing <clears throat> at the topest level uh, uh the 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 discoveries and the knowledge that they had from their suppliers medici in bekina but missing the top uh, uh, archive where these objects were ending up to um so uh, the authorities both italian and mainly but also the greek authorities ended up with um, a lot of traffic antiquities that were confiscated but mainly with uh, a, a big wealth unprecedented wealth of uh, archives of all sorts 
uh, with uh, handwritten notes, bank extras, um, uh, with letters uh, to and from auction houses, dealers' galleries, uh, museums, private collectors, revealing the true nature of the market, the international market in antiquities that is very murky, very muddy, in reality dark uh, through and through, and not at all as is being presented by the market itself. And this unprecedented load of volume of um, wealth of uh, evidence um, that never had uh, anyone, the authorities and beyond, the opportunity to work on, um, open uh, the real world towards uh, the investigations and the further research that they are ongoing still, as you know, with uh, the repatriations that are taking place all the time, especially towards Italy, but also to other countries, including Greece, uh, Egypt, uh, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, and so on. Just to main, name some of the ones uh, benefiting from the research in these archives, uh, photographs and documentations uh, together. Um, therefore, their discovery boosted the cooperation, demanded the cooperation between uh, at least Italy and Greece. And here you see, uh, literally under the same umbrella, the Italian prosecutor Paolo Giorgio Ferri and the Greek prosecutor Ioannis Diotis, um, who became my boss because after the raid of uh, uh, in Sinusa, uh, I was transferred with a document that he made from the Greek Ministry of Culture to the Greek Ministry of Justice to assist him on the archaeological part of the research, uh, i.e. on the archives, while he was handling the legal part of the confiscation, the raids, and the cases that followed. Um, with a written order, um, a certain order, to me to start identifying objects of Greek origin in order to the Greek from the photographs of all uh, the archives uh, in order to notify the Greek government and the Greek state and start claiming what it was stolen from them. Uh, that required, of course, first to get hold the copy of the Italian archives, i.e. the Medici and the Pekin archives. And indeed, in uh, the summer of 2006, uh, under the umbrella of Eurojust, to be as official as possible, uh, the delegations of the two countries met. I participated on that as well. And not only exchange archives, but on the spot, Paolo Giorgio Ferri, the Italian prosecutor, uh, asked me officially to cooperate with the Italians as well, which I, uh, with the permission of uh, Dr. Diotis, the Greek prosecutor, I gladly did. And it is a cooperation that started back then, and you see me there, um, at the uh, gardens of Villa Giulia Museum with Mauricio Pellegrini and Daniela Riccio. Um, so starting cooperating with them and this a wonderful, very fruitful cooperation that is still ongoing after the uh, uh, the retirement of uh, Riccio and Pellegrini uh, that um, uh, led to hundreds, literally, uh, not exaggerating, uh, of repatriations, especially to Italy, but to other countries, Greece and other countries as well. Um, just to give an example, some examples here from the Getty Museum. This is the work of Pellegrini and Riccio, depicted here at the gardens of the Getty Villa in Malibu, outside Los Angeles, California, uh, armed with a video camera back then, uh, in order to record, as they did, the, at the time, exhibited antiquities, uh, as they are circulating, of course, as in every museum, often. Uh, at the villa um, uh, of the Getty Museum. And there it was depicted uh, this uh, so-called trapezophoros, so a table support. Uh, imagine that there was uh, on the top a horizontal slab, uh, marble slab on it, which doesn't exist now, um, in the form of two marble griffins attacking a female do, young do. Um, a unique object um, that uh, still kept its uh, colors uh, from antiquity, as you see. Um, but the same object was identified by Richard Pellegrini in some of Polaroids uh, found, discovered in the Medici archive, uh, broken in pieces. You can see the central part here of the deer, uh, but the, uh, depicted in a, in a dark warehouse of a looter or a middleman. But the most important thing in forensic sense was the identification that the uh, newspaper that it is depicted on is uh, an Italian newspaper. Uh, that was traced and the date as well that gave the date of the 
uh, looting approximately of the object and also the Italian origin that uh, reinforced further the claim and the successful claim from the Getty Museum as it happened uh, as well. Um, also documentation that was later found, and I will explain you later how, um, uh, led to the re recontextualization of the object, which in an academic sense plays, makes all the difference. Um, usually is um, is not happening. It's a rare incidence when it's happening. And in this case, it did happen. So it um, recontextualized, we put together um, some of the uh, objects that uh, were uh, found together as a group uh, in this uh, tube where it came from. Um, while usually we will never find out uh, the associations between objects that show up in different places around the world as a result of looting and trafficking and dispersal in various in different places and different countries. Um, the negotiation uh, took place again uh, represented by uh, the uh, lawyer, Italian lawyer uh, Maurizio Fiorilli. Uh, with the um, uh, Getty Museum and resulted in the first instance to 42 antiquities, uh, some of them unique masterpieces uh, that uh, were repatriated to Italy between uh, 2004 to 2007. Uh, also, the press plays a vital role. First of all, with the um, uh, publication of relevant books, uh, actually, the Medici conspiracy book narrates the whole story, only the 2007 edition, while the 2006 edition hardback is incomplete. It is this edition, the paperback of 2007, that it is the complete one and corrected some of the few mistakes that the first edition uh, included. Um, and it was the first announcement of the global network as it was unfolding through the discovery of the organigram, but also of the subsequent raids. Um, but also, but uh, through the uh, newspaper articles all around the world, uh, um, in Italy, like um, the journalist Fabio Isman that I told you before, I mentioned before, but also uh, in other countries as well, in the UK, for example, you see an example here, the Italians trying to uh, put pressure um, in the UK government uh, on, uh, uh, 17,000 of antiquities that uh, were kept in London at the time, back in 2009-2010, uh, from the premises of Robin Symes and Christoph Michaelidis, as the remains of his of their company. And uh, you see how the the antiquities are being returned and celebrated, uh, the repatriation, uh, and exhibited in museums in order the public to be informed more about the crime, not only to admire the treasures that they are returning, not only to boost their uh, uh, identity and national pride very naturally, to my opinion, but also to help recontextualization, which is what matters. And uh, uh, this is the case uh, with the document I was telling you before, that uh, it was discovered through a leakage uh, uh, that took place um, from the archives of the Getty Museum to, uh, to um, uh, Los Angeles uh, journalists, Los Angeles Times journalists. Um, here, uh, Jason Fels and uh, uh, Framolino, Ralph Framolino that you see here, producing the Chasing Aphrodite book, uh, with again uh, in the cover uh, the sculpture of the Griffiths attacking the dog, and um, referring a lot to uh, this kind of uh, uh, volume of uh, thousands of documents from inside the archives of the Getty Museum that again open up uh, all kinds of uh, research threads uh, towards understanding this complex, the complexity of this uh, illicit, in a sense, market in reality. And uh, it was uh, there where uh, this document was discovered, uh, where it's uh, from inside the Getty Museum, it was accepted that um, this culture came with other objects that the Getty Museum independently acquired but actually were coming from the same tomb or nearby other tombs that they were looted and passed through Giacomo Medici before through an American uh, collector was, uh, sold to, were sold to the Getty Museum, revealing the whole uh, kind of tricks 
and changing of hands of these objects and uh, the members of this illicit market are using. Another example, this time from uh, uh, the Greek side of the things, was the sale of a magnificent Hellenistic gold um, reef. Um, undoubtedly, um, uh, a funerary object accompanying a very prominent, if not royal, uh, uh, deceased, um, sold officially uh, by an Austrian dealer, Christophe Leon, to the Getty Museum. And um, uh, the Greek authorities only managed to claim it uh, officially um, and properly after uh, we started uh, uh, researching the copy of the Bekin archive that was given officially to us uh, by the Italian delegation, as I mentioned before, where we discovered an envelope sent uh, from Thessaloniki, the second biggest uh, city in Greece, in Macedonia, northern Greece, um, with the uh, stamps, postal stamps with the dates and um, uh, address and so on, uh, which included a Polaroid image of the uh, reef in a condition before its restoration and before in its magnificency that was exhibited at the Getty Museum at the time. Armed with this and other photographic and other proofs, the Italian government managed to repatriate this object, the Greek government managed to repatriate this object. And uh, also because of the use of the material also that uh, were leaked to the two uh, American journalists of Los Angeles Times, uh, we managed to discover, they, they gave us actually the, uh, even the invoice of the sale of the wreath from Christophe Leon to the Getty Museum. Uh, where there is the 4th century BC you see here, then the US dollars 1,150,000 back in 19, early 1990s. But also, most importantly, there is no uh, other uh, provenance mentioned but the private collection Switzerland, which is now considered a real joke in the sense of uh, uh, researching private uh, in due diligence on provenance. The, uh, the return of the Golden Reef uh, was a, a big event for uh, uh, the Greek nation. And here we, you see us celebrating with the then Minister of Culture, Yorgos Vulgarakis, and some of the members of the task force uh, that we formed in order to, to help this repatriation, handling the evidence, like the late Yorgos Gligoris, uh, head of the Greek Police Arts Code, uh, the uh, journalist Nicolas Zirganos, member of the Greek Police Arts Code, and myself, as you see here, uh, 17 years earlier, and at least 17 kilos lighter as well. Um, and this is part of the exhibition of the reef um, in the New Acropolis Museum back in 2008 with the catalogue that it was produced, also with a part of the reef in uh, uh, on the cover page, <clears throat> but also following the exhibition that first took place, and we cooperated in that with other objects or antiquities that we managed to uh, be returned to Greece based on, on evidence of the archives, but also on other evidence that we had as Greek uh, authorities. <clears throat> and uh, cooperation that took place joint an exhibition between the Italian and Greek state, first in Italy, in the uh, uh, presidential palace in uh, but also, as I said before, in the New Acropolis Museum, which had, which bore, bore a, a, a significant message and was made deliberately to be the first exhibition that was held in the New Acropolis Museum, um, as of course its mission was to 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 eventually manage to bring back uh, the Parthenon sculptures from the British Museum. So it had a, a special weight. To, to that uh, it was decided the first exhibition in the New Acropolis Museum to be the exhibition of the repatriated, looted, and trafficked antiquities from Greece, but also from Italy as well. An example from a private collection is uh, the case in Michael Steinhardt here with his wife Judy depicted in the middle, um, wherein um, they tried to, and they consigned to sell through Christie's in New York uh, at an auction in um, early December 2014, 
um, several objects, among which uh, the one that it was uh, the most expensive one, this uh, prehistoric marble idol from Sardinia, the so-called goddess of Sardinia, uh, which uh, I saw in late November, um, about three weeks before the auction, um, in an evening in uh, in Glasgow, University of Glasgow, where I was working back then as a postdoc. And uh, I immediately remember that I have seen something similar. I couldn't know if it, if it could be the same. I checked the Medici archive and it was the same, broken in pieces, missing part of the head. As you can see here, it is the same object, unrestored in an image, um, a Polaroid image from the Medici archive. Um, I made other identifications in the same auction, five in total, uh, some from the Medici, from, some from uh, other archives, the Science Michaelidis, uh, uh, and uh, the Fringler archive, another archive, and so on. I notified the uh, Southern District Attorney's Office in New York um, about that. I sent them all the evidence, uh, the photographs, and so on. They, they consigned two agents of Homeland Security Investigations who went to Christie's, and soon after the objects were uh, withdrawn without though, though having any update whether they have been confiscated in order to be due to be returned to, to Italy or not. And being in limbo, I stayed like that for over three years when uh, eventually, uh, this time the District Attorney's Office of, of Manhattan in New York, so the central different District Attorney's Office in, in the same city, used the Medici image uh, that uh, I have given to the Southern District Attorney's Office three years earlier, and it was already published in the internet for all these years, uh, in order to raid the premises, the flat of uh, Michael Steinhardt in Manhattan, and not only discovered the goddess of Sardinia waiting there and confiscated, but mainly this gave the step to the American authorities to record the Steinhardt collection and then send it uh, to me officially through a judge's order, but also to many other <clears throat> researchers around the world and authorities around the world to help the American authorities, the District Attorney's Office in New York or Manhattan to to, to find evidence in order to seize these objects and return to the countries of origin, as it happened. And now the, the, the goddess of Sardinia is back to Italy, together, for example, with the most expensive objects in terms of, of monetary financial value, uh, this, this uh, torso, archaic torso of a Kuro statue, a Greek Kuro statue. This is the state that it was discovered in the Steinhardt collection. This is the, the same object upside down before restoration uh, in an image that uh, I discovered in the Hecht archive, uh, of the archive of Robert Hecht that we saw before. Um, but also during the raid and the confiscation of the archive of Michael Steinhardt, the collector himself, we see the same object immediately after it was discovered, looted in Greece, before they break it in pieces. Um, and parts of, of the pieces that you see by comparison of the two images here um, are still missing and they haven't been found. So parts of the arms or uh, uh, the legs uh, from the high of the thigh or onwards, you know, the knees, etc. All these are still uh, missing, unfortunately. That showed, uh, actually, that uh, the collector must have at least strong hint, or if not uh, complete reassurance, that he was acquiring illicit antiquities, since not only he bought the object, but he had in that state the images presenting in that state uh, the, the object that he acquired, unbroken and still covered with soil, etc. The final example is another collector, again from Manhattan in New York, much, much more well known, um, Selby White, who with her husband back then, Leon Levy, not only collected, but exhibit, exhibited their antiquities collection, the most well known antiquities collection in the world, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art back in 1990, producing this magnificent catalog. Among the objects, the hundreds of objects ex exhibited, um, was this upper part, more than half of the upper part of um, 
Slimmer Aristelle, Greek Slimmer Aristelle, Attic from Athens, uh, 5th century BC, which Professor of the Spin is one of the biggest uh, authorities, greatest authorities in sculpture, in ancient sculpture in the world, late now, Professor of the Spin is, have identified that is, it was matching the lower part of the stele that has been long found back in 1960s in Porto Rafti uh, and was kept at the Museum of Ravron outside Athens. And this is how it was matching. This is a, a representation that was created as a collage of images by Professor uh, David Gill, now at Kent, University of Kent. And uh, armed with this identification, without any doubt, it's, it belongs to the same object, the Greek government, uh, the, Greek, the same Greek task force that I participated. Um, uh, we claimed and repatriated this object due to the work of Professor Vespinis and uh, came back to Greece. Uh, Italy, back then, have uh, also claimed 10 objects successfully from the same collection. Uh, but then for many years, no subsequent claims could be made. Uh, however, again, uh, through a raid of the district attorney's office in New York of Manhattan, um, and the recording, uh, similar recording as it happened with uh, uh, Michael Stein, her case um, uh, of the whole collection, we were able to uh, identify more objects. Uh, uh, these are two of the over 35 antiquities that I identified uh, recently, last year, uh, for example, from Giacomo Medici archive, you see fragments of a vase of a crater that proved to be a crater that it was restored uh, up to a certain point to its original form. Uh, and you see here the same part of the decoration being fragmented before its restoration at the archive of Giacomo Medici, equally from the archive of uh, Robert Hecht uh, using these two images. Uh, I identified this uh, magnificent bronze protomy, a Roman protomy. Uh, you see the same protomy covered still with soil unrestored and uh, also the head of it out of the rest of the bust. These are, these are only two examples of uh, the many uh, that I identified and notified the American authorities with uh, having all, already obtained uh, the permission of an uh, American judge to be served this material uh, of the recordings of the uh, Selby White collection with me in order to start identifying objects. And these objects were repatriated back in Italy in a big celebration mm -hmm. in the center of Rome in uh, last January, actually. Um, but I was always, uh, as an academic, thinking, wait a minute, I have a privileged access to this confiscated photographic and documented material, which uh, nearly no one else around the world, apart from my colleagues Mauricio Pellegrini, Daniela Riccio, some journalists also, some other academics, etc., with various ways that they downloaded some of the archives that the Carabinieri themselves for nearly 11 years made available in their website for everyone around the world to download, like a big chunk of the Medici archive, for example. Um, but most of the uh, of, of uh, academics and archaeologists and researchers do not have this privileged access to these archives to work with. How can I develop possibly, if possible, a method, a new method that um, allows uh, every uh, researcher and archaeologist around the world to produce original results on illicit antiquities trafficking without having the proofs, the access to the proofs of these images and documents from the confiscated archives. And the opportunity was given to me back on the 1st of October 2015, as you see, uh, with a Christie's uh, auction in London, where I saw uh, lot 93, this uh, uh, Lekythos, red figure 5th century BC Athenian Attic Lekythos, um, on sale. And the only collecting history given by Christie's was this one that you see here, first anonymous sale uh, back in um, 1986 by Moons and Medellin in Basel, uh, and then uh, a former, formerly in a private collection in Japan that acquired privately, as they said, in 1997. Nothing in between the two, nothing after that, and nothing before the anonymous sale. So very vague, no names really, etc. And uh, uh, 
when uh, when I check my own archives, because I use to um, to to screenshot objects late in the evenings uh, from galleries in order to record the merchandise that passes um, through the the big galleries at least around the world, uh, dealers galleries that is. Um, I saw that eight months earlier I have recorded the same object in the gallery Phoenix Ancient Art in New York uh, by the dealers Hitcham and Ali Abutam, who are notorious ones convicted in various countries from all sorts of uh, dealings with the antiquities and so on. And um, therefore that's proved to me that um, uh, Christie's have deliberately omitted the consignors uh, probably of this the same object and definitely have omitted them as if not the current owners and therefore the consignors uh, definitely as very recent owners and therefore belong to the private to, to the provenance uh, that they didn't mention deliberately on the other hand when uh, uh, similarly i i uh, communicated that case to uh, my uh, friends and colleagues and cooperators, uh, Pellegrini and Riccio in Italy, and I told them what I have matched without having any evidence of it in the images of, from the confiscated archives. There is no image of this object in, the, in any of the confiscated archives. Pellegrini and Riccio notified me that they have seen this object uh, when it uh, the, the famous, infamous, actually, trafficker, Japanese trafficker Noriyoshi Horiuchi was raided at his premises, warehouses at the Port Frank of Geneva back in 2008. And actually, they sent me this image, which is the same object, but during the confiscation in the premises of Noriyoshi Horiuchi. That proved immediately to me that apart from the omission by Christie's of the Abutam's names as part of the provenance where it belonged, they also uh, disguised the Japanese trafficker Noriyoshi Horiuchi as a private collector, Anonymous. And therefore, by these two different, but belonging to the same case, crucial elements of identification without though having a visual uh, photographic identification like it usually happens from the confiscated archives, I published this case before the auction together with three more antiquities that I indeed identify from the Bekin archive. The result was that soon before the auction take place in London, Christie's withdrew all four objects and therefore treating this object, this Lekithos, um, that had no photographic proof of its illicit origin and linked with any trafficker. The, in the same way treated by the auction house, i.e. withdrawn, uh, as it, they were treated the other three for which they were um, uh, photographic proofs of uh, their link to the convicted traffickers. And that showed me, uh, make me uh, understand, but wonder also at the same time, how many times must we have been, must have we been um, uh, cheated by the market, deceived by the market with this kind of deliberate omissions, with this kind of deliberate, del deliberate um, uh, uh, disguisings of disguise of uh, and manipulation of the true identities and titles of the people involved, not an anonymous private collector, but a, a known. Uh, uh, trafficker, Japanese trafficker who have been raided recently and so on. The object apparently was given back to, to Noriyoshi Horiuchi after the 2008 raid because of the lack of photographic proof from these and other archives, etc. Um, not because it proved to be legal, but because it's still in limbo, because there is no proof that it is actually illicit. And according to the laws globally, uh, this is not to be returned, but is still being in circulation in the market. And hence, it appeared on sale uh, years later in 2015 uh, at auction. After its withdrawal, it's very interesting uh, that the next day it appeared on offer at the website of the gallery of Phoenix Ancient Heart, where I had recorded it eight months earlier, proving my point. So it's very interesting that uh, out of this, I immediately had uh, a new method 
and I, I put together an application and it was accepted for the maximum of research for three years uh, at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Aarhus, where from uh, October 2019 until September 2022, I conducted exactly this research um, from in the last decades, uh, from at least 2010 to 2020. Um, I recorded every antiquity that passed through the biggest auction houses and dealers galleries around the world, ending up with more than 65,000 images. And um, from there, I managed to indicate 1,207 so far cases of, of uh, antiquities, from which dozens now, dozens more than this initial one, are indeed uh, cases of manipulation of the provenance as a result of this. Uh, research and therefore that proves my initial thought that we don't necessarily need to have access to confiscated archives of course it's great if we do um, and the evidence photographic and other but also we now have a new method we can produce original results on approaching in a different way uh, illicit antiquities or antiquities in libo proving uh, through their collecting history uh, disproving actually the claims of the market both in association of the consigners but also in their previous uh, owners which definitely are not the in the way that they uh, they want to be presented like that Finally, because we are not looking, we are looking uh, out of necessity at the objects themselves uh, as a first step um, to identify them as illicit and therefore to have a clear, secure basis for uh, our uh, academic analysis. Um, with my brother, a computing scientist that you see here, Costantino Sirianis, uh, we cooperated. I, I gather all the cases referred in the Medici conspiracy book. We put them together with uh, the provenance that can be reconstructed as they were referenced in the book, uh, therefore published already material, but examining in a different angle completely uh, because my brother as a computing scientist wrote together, wrote an algorithm, a new algorithm, which um, uh, not only identifies the central nodes, you can see the diagram here, how all the names by name are connected dealers galleries middlemen looters museums private collectors etc but mainly this algorithm identifies nodes that are not being proven yet uh, by certain cases as existence so connections between uh, uh, these names and people and institutions and uh, companies etc uh, since then since um, uh, the publication of uh, our chapter in the volume The Connected Past of the Oxford University Press in 2016, uh, several cases have proved the connections that the algorithm have predicted uh, with actual cases that followed uh, of uh, identification, seizure, and repatriation. And therefore, our linear, simple, simple or simplistic idea that we had until 1995 and 1995 is the date, of course, of the first big raid against Giacomo Medici, uh, is now much better understood and known, is much more developed the way that the objects uh, are being trafficked, uh, not only because of the transcription of the knowledge of the uh, um, so-called organigram, but also this is what we ended up, me and my brother, uh, in uh, interdisciplinary cooperation and archaeologists and IT, computing science, uh, uh, from putting together the evidence that they were already there and published for years before, 10 years ago. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to, to thank you, to say that I'm available beyond this presentation, the questions that I'm very happy going to reply any that you may have. Um, I'm available also to be contacted in my Cambridge alumni mail, so christos.chiroyanis at cantab.net, uh, for any, to discuss any ideas or to answer any further questions that we won't have um, uh, possibly the time to, to reply after now. So thank you very much, and I'm all yours. Well, thanks a lot to Christos, and uh, it was very fascinating to go through all this history of discoveries, and uh, congratulations again for the success. Is there any question from the audience before I make mine?
<laughs> Thank you, Dante. Thank you for accepting to to be the discussant and uh, uh, presenter. Uh, uh, but also, thank you for all your help. I have a question. I have a question, Dante. Thank you, Chris. It's very interesting. So basically, uh, the effort uh, that has been done starts from um, the archives that have been discovered in the eighties, in the nineties, if I if I don't remember well. And my question is, um, uh, how many of these uh, pieces of uh, arts that have been uh, a store in this archive have been retrieved by the authority. Uh, you said that the, there were several hundred, probably thousands of pieces of work of art that were um, in the in these archives. Yes, thank you, Stefano. It's a very good question. And um, the the evidence uh, of objects depicted in the actual photos of all kinds, Polaroids, professional and regular print that were confiscated from all these archives, and we are talking about 12 to 15 archives, I've just showed you uh, the most uh, well-known through publications ones, Medici, Bekina, Sainz, Michaelidis, Hecht, there are many more, smaller but very important as well. Um, are of thousands, many, many thousands of objects, most of them unique, uh, others very usual ones, but for us, uh, we are, as you know, as archaeologists, we are not discriminating, it's, it doesn't matter the financial value or the aesthetic value, it matters the historical uh, value or the loss of history because of the trafficking and so on. Um, so far, they have been roughly uh, identified and repatriated mainly to Italy, fewer to all other countries, uh, more than 800 antiquities, unique masterpieces and lesser uh, aesthetically important objects, but equally important for us as academics. Uh, because of the information they held case by case about the trafficking and understanding the problem and therefore fighting the problem. And they remain uh, I would say about um, more than 50,000 objects yet to be um, uh, seized, I would say, because, uh, for example, myself and Mauricio Pellegrini and Daniela Riccio, we have identified um, now together, if we put together more than 2,000 objects. Um, so if uh, about 800 they have been claimed and repatriated successfully, which are not all our work, I have to say. There are other researchers around the world that they have done because of the authorities that have served the archives and so on. But um, a, a big chunk of it is our work indeed. Um, uh, the rest of the identified objects are objects that we are waiting to reappear in the market. Because of course we have uh, made the identification, but identified compared with images, for example, in auction catalogs that you see behind me here, back in the 80s and 90s where they appeared. And when they sold, since they were sold, they never reappeared in the market or they never been exhibited by any museum that possibly acquired some of them. And therefore we are waiting to reappear in order to make our move to notify the authorities of the country that have been affected by that theft in particular, in each case, um, in order to be effective the, uh, uh, the claim and repatriation. If we go and, uh, and publish, make, publish these kind of identifications that we already have uh, without this object to reappear, then the, there is a danger for the country to lose this object because they may uh, treat it in uh, a wrong way. For example, it's great if you have a lead that back then it was back, let's say in 1987, for example, it was sold in Sotheby's, but then it will require that Sotheby's will give you now, today, in 2023, accurate information of who was the buyer and then to trace what happened to the object with that buyer, if it's still with him or with his family, or it changed 10 times hands and where it is now, which is doable. And of course we can communicate that, but let's say that in many instances, the authorities haven't been cooperative with us while we have shared our work for free and often without any credit when repatriations are taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? 
Okay, I will make, well, I have a curiosity and a question. Uh, basically all your work was based so far on, let's say paper-based evidence. Now that this drafting is shifting to e-commerce, uh, social media, uh, how do you see that we can tackle these challenges? And my curiosity is, is anybody have been convicted after they've been caught? Thank you, thank you very much, Dante. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that I mentioned the last part of my research, which is deliberately completely different from being based on these photographs, i.e. by creating this new method that it is very effective, as you have seen with the first case even against Christie's, um, uh, is that um, is completely shifting uh, into digital research now. And uh, therefore, it uh, enables us with uh, new algorithms uh, that are being created. I am, for example, in cooperation now with a computing scientist in Orcus University um, and creating a new algorithm on that, on identification and grouping, categorizing of antiquities and so on, uh, to, to tackle this uh, in a digital way. Uh, I know from your experience and expertise that you are belonging in the same uh, area and trying to tackle this kind of crime from uh, this uh, end as well. Um, uh, and uh, therefore, I think it's a wonderful opportunity the last few years that this uh, area of digital research on antiquities trafficking is developing. Uh, we need more people. New people are coming in the, in the field and they are having new ideas of helping to tackle that. Uh, I think uh, it depends uh, very much uh, on, uh, on the way the objects are treated, the way the data is collected, uh, then this data, how it is treated uh, digitally and uh, manually. There are all sorts of questions, as you know very well, even ethical questions in treating this data as well. And then um, it's a big question of what you do with that and how you communicate it to the authorities, publish it, etc., uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, how the authorities are treating it and all that stuff. I think we are still in an embryonic um, uh, situation uh, and we yet have a lot to, 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 to see beyond us. But uh, the main thing is to cooperate all together if possible um, and um, personally, I'm always available with everyone who has good intentions for cooperation. The, as to the second part of second leg of your uh, question, um, many of these people that I showed you have been convicted. Uh, however, in reality, their conviction is just a slap on the wrist. For example, um, Giacomo Medici, yes, has been convicted to eight years imprisonment and the biggest fine ever been given for such a crime in Italy in 10 million euros fine, which he paid. Uh, but uh, his conviction uh, took place uh, uh, not in jail, but in his villa in Santa Marinella outside Rome. Um, uh, to my information, he, during his uh, spending time in his house, in his villa, he even created a second uh, tennis court. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, he he also uh, the conviction uh, was uh, diminished by two years because of presidential uh, uh, let's say pardon pardon exactly in the uh, kind of uh, uh, usually is taking place in Christmas and Easter and so on for many other convicted people and so on so you see in a sense uh, people became rich from this trafficking. Uh, and uh, procedure, they have been convicted, and yet the result is to have a slap on the wrist on that. Compared to lesser people, you know, looters that have been found and convicted based on the organigram in Italy and elsewhere, uh, but they spent actual time behind the bars. Uh, another uh, example is Michael Steinhardt that I showed you, the financier slash collector. Uh, who was found with 180 masterpieces, repatriated to 12 different countries, um, uh, valued in uh, almost $70 million just two years ago. And um, uh, the only result that he suffered was uh, a ban uh, for a lifetime not to acquire any antiquity anymore. From that, you can understand what is really happening actually and how can we actually fight the problem if the authorities themselves 
while they are having the opportunity to convict people, they prefer uh, in order to gain back objects and present them in big parties and so on uh, as a big success anyway, uh, but uh, do not give the example to, to people involved by being convicted themselves. And I don't think that is an effective way of tackling the crime as it happens with every other crime. They are convictions and they should serve time behind the bars. Why antiquities should be uh, uh, an exception? Uh, the, the low risk, high profit is the reason why all these organized groups are more and more interested in uh, illicit trafficking uh, of the cultural properties, unfortunately. Exactly. And it's bad to for the authorities to, to accept that as well. They, they should be the ones that they should do it, see it exactly differently. Uh, any other question? Okay, I don't see anybody. I don't know, Stefan, do you want to say something to close uh, the webinar? No, I think that this is the first um, webinar that we launched under the um, Working Group 3. And so thank you, Christos, for uh, having proposed to be the, the opener. <laughs> of this uh, series of uh, initiatives. So thank you for the, all the people who attended to this event. And uh, we're looking forward to you for the next meetings in the next months. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for the opportunity and the honor to be the first uh, webinar of the group. And uh, my hope uh, was and is still uh, to, to, to boost cooperation between uh, common threads, as I said uh, at the opening of my talk, uh, between different trafficking networks on different expertise that each one of us have, uh, whether you have identified some of them as common, please let's uh, communicate, form groups, and possibly, hopefully, uh, a cooperation, a further cooperation, academic and other, uh, in the future. So this is my main hope for this talk. So thank you so much, all of you, and thank you, Stefano and Dante, uh, for hosting us. All right, so I think uh, that's it for today. Thanks again from uh, my side, and uh, yeah, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.